This is the third of six webinars on starting to homeschool. Welcome, Pat. Hey, Steve. How you doing? Terrific. Pat is a homeschooling dad, as well as an author and a speaker about homeschooling, unschooling, and the work of John Holt. Pat published Growing Without Schooling magazine from Holt to Death in 1986 until 2001. He continues to speak and write about all the ways we learn without using standard school techniques and how a civil society is better enhanced by non-compulsory learning. Pat, so appreciate you doing the series. I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Steve. Um, when I gave my last webinar, I was talking about getting started with homeschooling. And I was talking about the different curriculum options that you have. Um, today, what I want to talk about is now that you've chosen your first curriculum option, you know, what do you what do you do? But one thing that I, I want to add at the start of this is that most states require a certain number of in, instructional days or instructional hours. Um, usually, it's 180 days of school instruction, and you know. School goes to great pains to say, this is learning, this is not. But that's school. Um, if you go to a different school, uh, like a Waldorf school or a private uh, in, uh, alternative school, they will have a different curriculum, and they will count different things as genuine learning, such as field trips or um, travel. Uh, with your family. I know right now there's a homeschooling family in Maryland, I think, that, that um, has been, not, not a homeschooling family, a family in public school that was, you know, reprimanded for taking a, a vacation during the school year. Um, I mean, reprimanded with a formal letter from their school board. It was you know, kind of surprising to see. But the thing is, when you're homeschooling, you're in charge of your school, and everything counts. This is your school and your educational philosophy. And you know, you may think, oh, there's only one type of way to teach math. There's only one educational philosophy that we all learn, and it's based on brain science or, you know, some deep, deep tradition of uh, education. Well, the fact is, there is no brain science that supports a lot of compulsory schooling. In fact, a lot of what we know about how people learn and create in the world is a lot different than what happens in school. And next there are schools. Like, you know, if you look at the curricula for a Sudbury Valley school and compare it to the Christian Liberty Academy and then say to the Clonmara school and then to any individual home school, you're going to see a lot of variation. So get comfortable with this. Everything counts. So you don't need to spend your time. Now, I know that they sell these little books just like they have in school where you keep track of how many minutes are spent on reading, how many minutes are spent on math, and you can do that. If you are doing school at home and that is comfortable for you and your whole family is behind that and no one's yeah, rolling their eyes and saying this is ridiculous, that, that's great because it can happen. Um, and so therefore, if, that's, if, if, if that is the way you choose to homeschool, that's great you know, um, because you found something that works. I hope it continues to work. Uh, in my experience, what worked one year as the kids change and grow, and as you grow and get a little wiser about you know the homeschooling market and what's going on, you may decide to change your philosophy or alter your curriculum or disband it altogether and try uh, unschooling. Um, the main point is to remember that everything counts. It's not just the stuff that happens that the curriculum says has to happen. I can't emphasize how often when we're putting our children to sleep, our three girls, it was those bedtime conversations that had incredibly deep, meaningful moments and that really carried, carried into the next day, sometimes for weeks, with uh, questions and activities that, that were generated from that. Um, I don't think school counts bedtime stories or bedtime period. Um, and as we discuss this today, you'll talk, we'll talk about the, value, the incredible value of conversation with your children. So there's all sorts of ways of just buying a curriculum and, and using it. Um, I, I'd like to just to spend a couple of minutes looking at that because a lot of people, look, we tend to teach the way we were taught. So start where you're comfortable, but question it because you're questioning it because it did, you, the way you were taught obviously isn't satisfactory to you because now you've taken your children or thinking of taking your children out of school. So why duplicate that? 
be bold. You have a lot of uh, opportunities here to, to work with your children and do something really exciting and different with them. Now, if you're doing um, a, a standard, you know, curriculum, you know, from home, and there's a lot of these curriculum suppliers that dominate, even within them, there's some variation. Um, there's a lot. For instance, there's a Christian version of unschooling called delight directed learning, um, or you could use the Trivium, which is uh, Charlotte Mason's ideas. Um, Susan Schaefer Macaulay's written about that, and Raymond Moore. Um, you don't, you know, and the, and the reason I bring those up is because even though even though that they have a very set curriculum, they all emphasize giving your children time and space to play and use the material that they're working with. Um, and then of course there are other uh, approaches at home, uh, secular approaches like uh, Susan Wise Bowers' Well Trained Mind, um, distance learning programs. Um, I mean, you could easily fill your 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 child's day with school-like activities that you purchase online or that are for free online and in your local community. But why duplicate school if it wasn't working for your kids in the first place? But I understand that people like to start where they're comfortable. Um, the other problem that I just want to you know make mention is if you're going to duplicate school at home, you run the risk. It's minor. It's a minor risk. But if you don't have a friendly or at least a sympathetic uh, school board member Who's, or evaluator who's looking at your program, because you're duplicating at school at home, they may really judge you as if you're a school. And, and, and unless you're really following the school curriculum, that could really be a problem for you. So um, you know, definitely having an educational philosophy that you stay outright you know, um, is going to be different than the school, and therefore you'd like to use alternative evaluation methods. I covered all that in the, the second webinar. But I, it is related to this. It's the bridge into this. So, um, you know, school at home can work. There are ways, and it doesn't have to be this strict miniature school at home. In fact, that's the, you know, sort of this middle ground that uh, has been, been known as eclectic homeschooling, where the parents pick and choose the materials. Well, that sounds a lot like unschooling to me, except what I've learned is that a lot of eclectic homeschoolers don't really feel that their child should have as much a say in the matter as the parent, that the parent's in charge all the time still. And that's semantics, I feel, because, I mean, unschooling parents aren't giving up their parental uh, rights, but they are giving um, their children a say in how they're going to be taught and what they're going to learn. And, you know, so, I don't know, I find it splitting hairs when I, when I talk with eclectic homeschoolers because it's such a fine line, but to me it seems to be that philosophy issue that divides them. And, and that's okay, because at least if you're picking and choosing, and if you remember from the previous seminar, there was research from Dr. Brian Ray that showed that 71% of homeschoolers, whether they're, they're school at home or, or they, they pick and choose, they create their own curriculum. So, the, so eclectic seems to be the, 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 how the majority of unschoolers uh, go. Um, oh, I didn't mean to hit that yet. Um, and then finally, we have unschooling. Now, the phrase is, causes a lot of trouble. We've discussed this before. Let's just call it self-directed learning for now because I think it's, it, it's a lot easier to get. Um, but one thing that I'd like to emphasize about unschooling that people forget, because everyone think that home, thinks that homeschooling is about isolating your children, or even if you don't want to do that, just, just by homeschooling them, you're doing this terrible isolation and harm to your child. One of the main reasons John Holt felt homeschooling would work is because of the socialization it provides. He worked in private and public schools, well mainly, largely private schools, and, and he saw the social life of schools as snobbish, mean-spirited, and absolutely um, deadly. And in fact, <laughs> we've seen it become deadly now. Um, back then it was just an adjective for John, now it's a reality for too many students with the rise of bullying. So. Um, you know, John said there's got to be a, you know, children learn socially. He, he saw this from the minute they were born, how by being in the midst of adults, children learn to walk, talk, and socialize. So why don't we continue doing that? So unschooling actually is not, is about letting your child get into the world. It's not about hiding them from the world. It's about, it's a social way to learn. It truly is learning by doing. It's really giving the child agency. 
not the fake agency of, oh, you could choose to do chapter one or chapter two in this book, or you can choose to, you know, to do this math problem or that math problem. I mean, these are real choices that children learn to live with the consequences of and therefore really feel that their, ma that their decisions matter. So a lot of you are probably thinking, okay, I might agree with some of that, but where is the evidence you know, that children will learn if they won't be, aren't taught? Well, first of all, think about how your children learn to walk and talk. There, the evidence is before your eyes. But there's, there's a lot more, but we get so hung up. School directs our attention to the curriculum and the goals and the test scores, and that's all we look at. We don't look at like the child, the child that's creative. In fact, we've, we've almost like made creativity, unless it's a money-making idea, a negative idea in school. We don't want kids to, to play with pens and pencils and objects and, and think of new ways to use them. We're all worried that they're not using things the correct way. We have very little patience for children's silliness and in in the play that, 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 they in, that engenders true intellectual curiosity and can spur deep conversations. Uh, Dr. Peter Gray's book, Free to Learn, explores that a lot. And that came out in 2013, 2014, I believe. And John Holt's learning all the time, way back in 1988, you know, was describing all this about how small children learn to read, write, and count uh, and investigate the world without being taught. There's a whole area of, of uh, pedagogy, well, it's not pedagogy, of learning science, I guess you call it, that I've learned about recently, called perceptual learning, which is just how, how we learn just by perceiving things. Um, and of course, you know, we know that there are multiple intelligences, all these different ways of learning. Uh, the most recent book I, I've read that I've liked about this topic is Blake Bowles' The Art of Self-Directed Learning. What I think this book could help you with as a parent is to see how you can help your child, you know, because he explains like, you know, ways of brainstorming um, to get creative and come up with new ideas, and also gives really good examples of what is happening in each one of these tips that he shows. And I think just about any parent who's got young children would benefit from reading this because they could see these things slowly taking place or give them ideas of how to help their child initiate such a thing. And if your children are teenagers or older, it's a wonderful book to give them, let them share, to give them confidence about how to find things out and do things. This whole issue of whose need to be taught, of course, John Holt dealt with in, in Ivan Illich in great detail. And you know, they, they both conclude it's the adults' need <laughs> to teach. You know, kids, you know, teaching does work, they both agree. And teaching is necessary at times. But there's way too much teaching in our lives. Way too much. And it's gotten and, and because the the teaching relationship is master pupil, it's automatically a coercive relationship, the way it's set up in conventional school. It's automatically that way. There's a lot of coercion that just built into it, and people resist coercion. So th there's a lot to wonder who's need to be taught. But one of the most interesting things about this was research that I found by Dr. Richard Medlin. And this, I forgot what, when it came out, I think it was in the late 90s. But um, he, w he wrote a paper called Predictors of Academic Achievement in Home-Educated Children, Aptitude, Self-Concept, and Pedagogical Practices. And he found that the lower the level of direct instruction, the shorter the teaching year, and the less frequently rewards and grades were used, resulted in higher levels of achievement. Ironically, parents expressed higher levels of satisfaction with their homeschooling experience when their programs were more intensive. Now think about that for a minute. You know, so often, you know, we hear about, you know, parents who force their kids, you know, who live through their children to get into to an Ivy League school, for instance, or something like that, or become a doctor because they were denied being a doctor, or they're a doctor and they want their child to be just like them to validate their success, stuff like that. But, you know, we all know that in a way that's not serving a child in, in their goals, and yet here we are in, in school and in our home schools, and the more we dominate and feel that we're helping our child learn, the better we feel, even though the evidence shows 
that's not really helping them learn. You know, unschooling requires patience with different scopes and sequences for learning than our current trends in society and education allow. And you've got to remember, these are trends. The internal mechanisms of learning to read, write, and calculate do not change every time Pearson or the college board decide a new fact or skill must be learned. The first rule of medicine is do no harm. Keeping one's love of learning intact in the face of education's colonization of a child's mind is a problem noted throughout education literature. Indeed, John Holt wrote in his first book, I teach, but they don't learn. Why? That was the riddle Holt sought to solve in his fifth grade classroom. And John decided to see if his teaching interventions were actually hindering his students' learning, and he determined it was. John saw how much the students were discussing, learning, and reading about the topics that interested them, and he worked with that. Of course, John got fired from every school he taught at as a result. The other teachers complained about the noise in his classroom, complained about their students asking to do the things that the students in Holt's classroom were doing, and so on. The parents were dissatisfied because even though the kids were getting better test scores, they were annoyed that Holt wasn't being disciplined enough. But Holt stuck to what he believed in, and John saw with his own eyes that children are better at learning than most par parents and teachers and any adult will give them credit for. And this is why homeschooling eventually attracted John as something to do instead of reforming schools. And in 1977, he started GWS, Growing Without Schooling, and coined the word unschooling in the hope that it would sound less dangerous than de-schooling and a totally different way of looking at homeschooling which people still picture as creating a miniature school in your home. Now, there's a lot of research, and I just really quickly want to run over this, just, just because I feel there's so much evidence, and everyone knows it's self-evident that you read a book, you take a test, you buy a curriculum, you, you make the kids run through the materials, and you grade them. That's school, right? That's what school should be like. Well, let's... Let, let's look at that a little bit. Back in 1987, there was uh, the head of the American Education Research Association, Dr. Lauren Resnick, gave her farewell speech. At, um, she was associated with the University of Pittsburgh. And in her last speech as president of the American Education Research Association, she wrote, growing evidence points to the possibility that very little can be transported directly from school to out-of-school use. There it is. And that, that was said, has been said, Dr. Ivar Berg and other people have studied this even before her. And even now, with all the, te all the technology we have, we're still not sure just how much of this transmission of knowledge from school use to out-of-school use occurs. Um, and so, you know, and that was written in 1987. If you're interested in reading it, because she cites all sorts of studies, the study is called Learning in School and Out. And um, I, I'll never forget the way I learned about it was I used to read the American Federation of Teachers column uh, because the, Albert Shanker wrote it every Sunday in the New York Times. And I would read it to either get infuriated uh, you know, and, and get some fodder for something else to write. But he actually wrote about this paper and agreed with Dr. Resnick and said, you know, we know as teachers we have to do something different. That was 1987, and I said, gee, I've been at this company growing out schooling since 1981. We're doing something different. Why isn't anyone paying attention to us? Well, here it is, 2015. I'm glad you're paying attention. There's now 2.5 million homeschoolers, and in school, they're still trying to figure out how much more we can force children to learn, how much more instruction can they take, how, much, you know, how, much, how many tricks can we use to motivate them to learn. Um, Another uh, piece of evidence that's very modern is Sugata Mitra's work. Oh, and by the way, um, all these uh, citations are on uh, the handouts. Um, you know, um, Sugata Mitra's hole-in-the-wall experiments have shown that in the absence of supervision of formal teaching, children can teach themselves and each other if they're motivated by curiosity and peer interest. Again, if you watch the videos of Mitra, it proves Holt's point. Uh, and you're not watching vid videos of Mitra. You're watching the, the videos Mitra made of the children using the computers in the wall of the village. And what, what you, you will see is social learning. 
the kids are arguing. They're making fun. They're, but they're getting to the point. They're showing each other how to use those computers. It's a very social thing. In fact, the next level that, that Mitra has gone to is you know, trying to find out like how, how we can improve the classroom learning situation for children in poor, uh, poor areas of, of India. And he came up with the granny cloud because what he found out that was grandmothers reading stories to children and just giving them encouragement seemed to raise all the children's achievement levels in, in the class and, and just the general goodwill of the class far more than direct instruction in the best curricula and so on. So check out Mitra's work if you doubt that children can teach themselves. Um, and of course, your vi everyone's mileage will vary with this because you know I know some people are completely comfortable doing unschooling except for math. They say, oh, that's the one thing I, I insist my child learn. Fine, that, that, that's that's your business. I know that you know some homeschool unschoolers will get very upset with that and say you're not unschooling anymore. Fine, you know. Life is a continuum. Now they're not unschooling. Maybe you call whatever you want. Then they go back to unschooling. You know, this idea that you got to choose a camp and live in it for the rest of your life and learn that way, it, it, it does not match up with reality. Because most unschoolers I know at some point do use a, a school, but it's they're choosing it. And we're going to talk about that in a, in a minute. Um, let me go back here to the slides. So... So, you know, what happens, you know, when a child wants to learn on their own? Um, well, first of all, you get a, a lot of people get hung up on this idea of structure in the home, you know, and, and they say that, oh, if I don't wake up and have a curriculum, you know, my life is just going to be completely a mess. You know, there's, you know, there's no goals, nothing. But... John Holt wrote a book called Freedom and Beyond, which is currently out of print. I, I'm actually about halfway done bringing it back into print. I'm, I've got to relay it, lay out the whole book again. But I'm close to it. And in that book, he talks about how there is no such thing as no structure. I mean, there's structure in, all, in every aspect of our lives. But it's, So what Holt makes is this distinction between inherent structure and imposed structure. We don't trust inherent structure. In fact, we don't think there is such a thing anymore unless, uh, you know, unless you've already felt that way. And when I say we, I, I mean society. Because society seems to think that you're only valuable and doing valuable things if you're working in a job where other people are supervising you and you're producing a product at that moment. Inherent structure is a structure like two strangers meet in the street. You say, what time is it? And he tells you. There actually is a structure to that meeting, even though it seemed unstructured. You know, it's like you wake up, you brush your teeth. We do, we do have schedules that, that are built in. And then what happens is, you know, when our children are young, we're very comfortable using the, um, the inherent structure. I mean, this is, you know, we feel very comfortable using inherent structure. It's there. I mean, our, we can see our children learning. And then as we, we get confidence in this, as they start to, to use words and then perhaps start to learn to read and you know, identify their colors and stuff, we, you know, we, we can appreciate it. But it seems as they get closer to school age, and unfortunately school age is now getting down to like three and four, and then you start to get that pressure from parents, other parents, or from your own parents who you know, will call up and say, gee, you know, what's going on you know, it, with, with, um, with, with little Johnny? Or, you know, he wasn't reading very well the last time I saw him. Are you sure he's going to be okay compared to his friends in school? And usually what happens is we move from the inherent side of the continuum and we start to move more towards the middle and, and you get that doubt in your mind and say, gee, you know, yeah, maybe I should make Johnny read a Dr. Seuss book or maybe I should, should get him to, to do the Bob books or whatever the reading method or choice is that, that you have out there. Um, and then you start to move more towards the imposed structure that those curricular things have. But then as your child gets good at it and you say, you know, oh, my parents don't even know what they're talking about. My, my child is doing great. Then you relax and you go back to inherent. And I, I found that a lot of parents do that. They, we, you know, we move back and forth. And particularly if you're going to give yourself, your child choices, you know, they're going to be moving from classes that are imposed, that have deadlines for papers and whatnot at some point, if they go to community college, for instance, as a high school student, or, you know, the inherent, oh, I didn't mean to click, 
or inherent, where they are, um, you know, just you know, they wake up and they love reading the Harry Potter books. Oh my gosh, you know, I'm amazed at you know some homeschooling parents who said, "I wish my child would stop reading." You know, we talk about inherent structure. These kids just love to read. Um, it's a weird problem to have. <laughs> I know a lot of parents who wish they had that problem. But you know, the inherent you know, nature of some children is that way, and others, you know. You know, need more direction or want more direction, and that may vary. They may only need it a certain month of their life or a day even. You know, so you got to be real careful. Think of structure as a continuum, not as a permanent place. You know, um, the other thing about structure I wanted to mention is that you know, if you're going to rely on the inherent side of of structure, you you may say, then what do I do? What's my role? You know, my kids do it all, and that's not true. Particularly if your kids are very young, you know, they still may not be able to to learn to read, and they may not have a good sense of direction and so on. So yeah, they're going to need help getting around and, and whatnot, you know. But you, the parent, you seek and organize materials, ideas, books, videos that you think the child might find of interest, and if and, and that your child tells you that they're of interest, and then that's even easier if your child gives you a clear notion that they want to work. They want to study turtles, or they just want to play with um, with uh, lasers. You can figure out a way to do that. And when I say lasers, I, I, I bought that was my wife found a game that you. It's like a chessboard with little lasers. It's fascinating. Lasers and mirrors on it. So like a little twelve, fifteen dollar board game. But again, fascinating stuff. You know, so you, you can have like a six year old play play with lasers and, and figure stuff out <laughs> with them. Um, you can organize field trips, play dates, travel. Book called Car Schooling by Diane Flynn Keith talks about uh, about some of this, and you know what happens? Like I said in my last webinar, you just write this down, or you take a video or a photo to remind you, or you save like whatever it was that your child created that day, put it in a file folder, and then this is called the after the fact curriculum. You know, for instance, a friend of mine um, has been unschooling uh, her children and her daughter. Uh, one of her daughters is really uh, into music, and they've been feeding that interest of hers for years. It's been great. Um, the daughter got into Harvard. Getting into Harvard was not the goal for studying music. Getting into Harvard wasn't even the goal of their home education program, of their unschooling. <laughs> they were just living life and enjoying it and building on their daughter's interests and and you know, and then I, I I know several homeschoolers who've gotten into Harvard because I live in the Boston in the Cambridge area, and um, most of them did it without any deliberate plan. They just oh I'll try Harvard I'll see if I get in, you know, and they did using this inherent structure. And that brings up the next thing, which is motivation to learn. You know, um, so many people talk about. Oh, I can't get the kids to learn because they're using the extrinsic. You know, they're giving, they're using um, rewards, you know, candy, grades, incentive plans, gold stars, praise to make kids learn instead of the intrinsic motivations that children have to learn. Like, oh, I want to know how this works, or that looks like fun, or I want to touch that. <laughs> you know, I mean, depending on the age of the child, you know, you have to, to go with these things. Um, but we just emphasize the extrinsic. We just think that children won't learn anything unless they're shown, and it has gotten so bad in our society that we've eliminated most of the arts, most of the music, most of the play from school. It's all science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And you know, even though there's pushback and parents are, are not, you know, are, are protesting tests and whatnot right now. Homeschooling is your, or if you can find an alternative school that, that fits your needs. That would be great, but these are the only options that are available to parents that, that are anywhere near affordable, and a lot of alternative schools can be expensive. So think about uh, uh, using your child's intrinsic motivation. Now, what does that mean in practice? Well, let me give you an example. A mom I know, her son loves machinery. He just wants to see all different types of machines. So the mom wisely decided to... Uh, take some trips to different factories with him. She just called him up and found out that, you know, they were allowed to do this. I think he's only six or seven. So um, they did a couple of these, and then when she told other homeschoolers you know, about it, they said they'd be interested. So she's organized a few trips. And so now um, 
you know, they've done a lot of factory tours. They've done a chocolate factory here in Somerville. They went to uh, the Cabot Cheese in Vermont and Ben and Jerry's. They also went to a, a cider press. Um, they went to the Bureau of Engraving and Printing in Washington, D.C., which is a money factory. And um, they, they went to the Cape Cod Potato Chip Factory in Hyannis. And then I found out from you know, an, another woman who was on the list who, who said, oh, check this out, factorytoursusa.com. So wherever you travel now, you could go and view a factory. So that's using your child's intrinsic motivation. Does it have this incredible curriculum that's going to have like all these questions at the end of each page that you have to ask your children to make sure they got they understood it? No, we're trusting a child's perceptual and um, auditory and 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 we, their parent, know that they learned something. Was they're able to talk intelligently about it afterwards, or write about it, or create something about it if you need to do that. Or they want to do that. Some kids really do want to do that. But being forced to like make a representation of the uh, experience you just had, if that's not a, a, intrinsically motivated, that is one of the, the classic extrinsic things that school does that that most people just resent after a while. You know, um, it just you know it's it's more for the school to have a product. Say, see, we took them to a field trip, and then we can show that they learned something because then they made a model of the factory. You know, we don't. You don't need that. You know what your children know, and you can prove it by dynamic assessments, by talking with them, and so on. You know, um, briefly, if you are trying to organize homeschooling, unschooling events, you know, there's always you know people that that are good and energetic. Sometimes you burn out because you, you'll set something up, and parents won't arrive. I've often heard some some homeschooling, unschooling parents say that it really is the, the parents that, that are more of a problem than the kids because, you know, they're not following through on their commitments to show up for some things. But, you know, people don't show up for school activities too. We just have to take all this with a grain of salt. You know, I really think you have to follow through on your obligations and, and try to do so at all times. But, you know, if people don't show up, you know, you just have to find humor in that, and you know, and and, and roll with the punch. You know, um, there, there are probably good reasons for it, but there are places that will, um, there are places that will uh, organize these trips for you. I know a few homeschooling uh, families that have organized little companies to do such things. I don't think any of them, and they, they come and go. So, I mean, the, if you don't want to organize it, you could probably find someone who will organize it for you. But it really. It's it's it really starts from selfish reasons. Your child wants us to go to a factory. Let's take them to a factory. You know, oh, would you like to join us? And that's how it happens. It doesn't have to be this uh, a big organized you know, thing that takes three months to plan. Um, another thing is, don't feel that you have to do it all. You know, it's not all about your children. You know, it's also about you. One of the great things that, that I found from homeschooling is that I met a lot of great adults. And you know, here we are, our children are all growing up, and we actually got together last month. Well, I guess around six weeks ago now. But you know, it was just like old-time homeschoolers get together at a local church because we hadn't uh, seen each other. We kept bumping into each other saying, oh, you know, we should, we should get together. It would be fun. So, so a couple of women pulled it together, and we had a blast. It was great catching up with everybody, you know. Um, and other things that happen, like you know, when my when my uh, daughter got interested in Japanese, she had uh, two male friends, uh, Willie and uh, Jeff, who also want to study Japanese, and so they took. We found a tutor. They studied with a Japanese tutor, and my friend Chuck, uh, Willie's dad, he uh, is a big sportsman. I'm not, but uh, I I enjoyed Chuck's company a lot, and so he said, "Want to play basketball?" Because we had 90 minutes to kill. So we shot hoops for 90 minutes, and then as the class went on and the winter came, he said, you want to try cross-country skiing? I never did cross-country skiing. So for that 90-minute period, we did cross-country skiing near, near where uh, Yuko's house was. And, you know, it was, it was, it was, Chuck is now one of my best friends. I mean, there's, there's so many benefits to getting out in the world and, and sharing your, your children and yourself and, 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 and exploring it together. It's a really wonderful experience if, if you're open to it. Um, 
you know, one last thing I want to say about um, you know structure and motivation is about chores. Uh, a lot of people feel that um, your children should do chores. Well, I, my wife and I happen to feel that children should should participate in making the the family work, making the house work. That's our philosophy. But we don't feel that you should be paid to do that. If you want to make charts and allowances and other incentives to get chores done, fine. I mean that that that's your business again. Um, and and I and I think it's important that chores get them because that's what schools call life skills and or what used to be called home economics, I guess. And those skills are all being pushed out the, the side door because of the emphasis on, you know, gosh, teaching teaching our kids to do computer programming, which so many people seem to learn in, you know, either on their own or in a year or a couple of months in a hacker school. But here we are spreading it out over twelve years of school. Anyway, that's that's a sideline. I, I just want to say that by creating a team spirit in your home, you know, to make the house comfortable for everybody. No one gets paid to empty the trash because it simply must be done. But mutual respect is needed, and this takes negotiation, trust, and love among each other to work. And it's a messy process. It's a lot easier to say, take it out now, or take that garbage out and I'll give you a quarter. But, you know, talking it out and figuring it out and, and getting the reasons straight in everyone's mind why we do this I think is worth the time. It's always worth the time to talk things out with your kids, I feel. Absolutely. And another thing is, you know, what if your child doesn't learn what they should learn in, let's say, fifth grade, um, or third grade. In third grade, they, they should know how to read, you know, do independent reading. Let's say your child isn't doing independent reading at the end of third grade because they were doing unschooling or uh, and, and they got so interested in rocketry that they were making you know those mental rockets you know that use uh, soda and mentos and you know all sorts of stuff they, they just went down that whole path of hands-on science and that you did that you did that project learning well guess what this I, I can't emphasize this enough this is your school you're doing project-based learning in your school, and you're emphasizing science this this year. This is it. And you, how are you going to fix it? Well, we are going to do exactly what you do in school if a child doesn't learn. We're going to remediate it. We will cover it over the summer. We will cover it in weekend tutorials, or we're going to get to it next year. That's on, you know, We see that as a need that needs to be addressed next year, but this year we were so successful with science and math that reading took a back seat, you know. It's okay. You can do that and you can say that to the schools, you know. In fact, you can even skip it. If you feel that, you know, reading in fourth grade is, is preferable to read, learn to read in third grade, you can do that. In fact, late reading among boys is very common in, in homeschooling situations where the child isn't forced to learn to read. And um, in, in the last seminar, uh, in the handouts, I gave references to a Dr. Alan Thomas's research on that and Dr. Raymond Moore's. So, you know, relaxing about what it, you know, the number of hours that you have to teach a child and therefore, like, am I going to reach it, you know, and feeling that you have to sit there and teach them everything. I hope you're seeing that you don't need to do that, that it's going to happen naturally and just keeping track of it and enjoying your time with your children and answering their questions and developing your own questions and friendships is a, a much better way to spend your time. But most importantly, one thing that I think it, that's, that gets lost in school is we think that you can teach everything. You know, John Amos Comenius, called the father of, of education, this medieval alchemist, his motto was to teach everybody everything perfectly. Well, that's quite a, a goal, but let's face it. There are some things that can and can't be taught. You know, John Holt often said, it's good books, not good reading methods that make good readers. You know, and the first step that a child has to becoming a good reader, as Holt noted, is when they grab a book and hold it and say, this is mine. I like this. That's the first step. Not getting them to understand vowel diphthongs or consonants blends, you know. So we we've got to get that, and you can't you, you just can't teach that. You can't teach morals, ethics, and philosophy. Um, I mean, we know you can in school, 
But look at all the lawyers and politicians and religious leaders who have graduated who are not moral, ethical, or philosophical. You know? Just being taught it doesn't guarantee it, it is learned. And patience, hope, and trust. How on earth can you teach that? They can only be learned. They can only be learned in, 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 by each person. And you should appreciate this as, as a homeschooling parent. Because in school, I think a lot of teachers get this and really, really feel bad that they can't do this. And many of them try in their own ways. You know, um, slipping kids books that are on the curriculum or recommending videos or books or people to talk to. You know, um, but it's, it's school is just just too much because they want to teach everything all, all the time. There's, they're John Amos Comenius on steroids, and that they've got technology and big data behind them. But we need to work with each individual child because they are our our children, and you know our neighbors' children and uh, children are that that we come in contact with, and they learn more by how they're treated by what they're taught, and therefore teaching children is just one step towards it. It's much more important to treat a child well than it is to teach them well. So what what ultimately is needed to become a homeschool teacher? Well, be a parent always. You can always hire a teacher. If you don't have specific knowledge on a subject such as geometry or biology, you can facilitate that and guide your child through books and courses. You can mentor them. You can hook them up with other uh, teachers. Um, you can find courses that they could take at local community colleges or you know, learning centers. You can even find graduate students or teachers who are, want to earn money uh, you know, on the side. There's many, many things. But the most important thing that I, that I think always gets lost when we talk about this issue is that parental warmth and affection time and time again come up as factors that determine whether a human, a person, is successful. There, I based that comment on, on a study that was done at Radcliffe University in 1991. Um, the Boston Globe reported it in April 8, 1991, if you're interested. And the summary is, there is no recipe for raising children to be successful adults. And this is Radcliffe, right? So Harvard, Radcliffe, these are you know, the, the most successful grad, uh, college graduates allegedly in the country, right? So there is no recipe for raising children to be successful students, but parental warmth and affection make more of a difference than any other factor. The main finding was that subjects who had warm mothers or warm fathers were more likely to be rated as higher in social accomplishments 36 years later. So that's a really solid longitudinal study. And then, of course, there has been studies that show dinner table conversation is, is really important. Um, and, and they often cite the dinner table because, well, everyone's at school or work, so that's the one time we all get together. But I really feel that if they were to look a little deeper at this, they would find any conversation that, that an adult has with a child that, is, that goes beyond the surface is valuable. So you know, one of the things that they're finding that you know, low-income parents don't do enough with their children is converse with them. You know? and, and there's a lot of reasons for that. You know? These parents, I mean, as middle-class parents, I'm, you know, we're certainly feeling the, the stress of, of income disparity and you know, rising costs and, and stagnant wages, but they've been feeling it for even longer. And you know, it, it, they're under a lot of pressure, and that does not make you particularly warm. <laughs> if you're not feeling safe and secure, it's hard to make your child feel safe and secure. So again, as John Holt and Illich and so many people have mentioned, you can't just teach a child you know, and expect that to make them a successful adult. There's a lot more to this. There's a much bigger context, and homeschooling is a great way for, for dealing with this. Not everyone can homeschool, but it shows the schools and society so many other ways that we can be spending our money and creating resources rather than just making the institution of school more inclusive and more authoritarian. Um, let's see, the next... 
the next thing I just want to say was, if you're going to live with your child, you know, during school hours, you know, if you're going to be home with them, you know, a lot. Now, this is a big topic because there are many creative solutions that will make this work. Because the main reason we use school and and, and for increasing hours is because we, most adults have to work. And where do we put the kids? We put them there, and we figure it out. We'll create value by educating them. And of course public schools started off to teach the Bible, right? That was Horace Mann's goal, but things have changed a lot since 1850. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, we're still not sure what the purpose of school is. Legally, it is to create good citizens, and I guess, you know, there's more than enough debate on that. <laughs> so, children and work, you know, what can you do? You know, a lot depends on your support network and the money you have. So I don't want to make it seem like juggling work and homeschooling is a breeze. It's not. But it can be done. You know, if you own your own business, as I did, you know, my wife and I were able to bring our children to work with us, and we also encouraged our colleagues at Holt Associates to do so. We created an environment that allowed that to happen. Other ways that I know that this has happened, split shifts, exchanging child care with other homeschoolers so you can work, using grandparents uh, during the day while you work or the night if you're working at night, working from home if you're doing telecommuting that can be an option. Um, you know, these are some ways that homeschooling parents you know, juggle full-time work. But the main thing is to realize that you have options, that you know, you, you can homeschool with full-time work with more than one child at home it, you know but you need to be creative and and open to to the fact that your child can learn on their own um, oh, I'm sorry so I, on the handout I provide a whole bunch of community resources I don't I spend a page talking about online resources but there's so much out there for online stuff and I think that you know, we're just getting sucked into the virtual world so easily that I, you know, that's easy to deal with now. What I'm finding is that people forget that the real world is really what where children live and want to live. You know, they don't. I mean, I know a lot of kids like video games, but they also need fresh air and play and exercise and other kids and, and musical instruments and toys and pots and pans and things to use. You know, so we we want to get them out there. So I provided a lot of community resources. Um, you know, of, of things that you can use in your daily lives and at home. Um, be your child's asker. You know, if, you know, particularly for young children. You know, they may say that they're interested in learning how cars go, but they're not going to go to the local auto body shop and ask, you know, can can you show me how a motor works? You know, you can do that for your child, and that will help them. Um, and then finally. Make your home. If you're gonna, you know, if you're worried about socialization when you're when you're teaching your children at home, make your home a spot that children want to come to. This is something that that um, I read about in GWS back when video games were, were coming out. And a homeschooling mom talked about how they bought a Nintendo, and you know, it became a draw for all the kids in the neighborhood. It was the only family that had it at that time, and so. You know, their home became you know quite a popular spot there for a while, and they met a lot of different kids as a result, and new friendships came out. Um, some other examples that I can provide from our own life. Um, my wife, Day, um, created a scavenger hunt for my daughter Lauren and her best friend at the time, Aiden, and they loved it, and they told all their friends about these really fun scavenger hunts they were doing. And of course, one thing led to another. Next thing you know, my wife is doing scavenger hunts for up to ten kids, and now they're getting elaborate. Those days, my wife got into it too, and so they created the detective club, where they would meet uh, once or twice a month at, at our house, and they had I think it got up to like twelve or fifteen kids at one point, and so she she would come up with like mysteries for them to solve. She got like sound effects records from the library and played a sound effect and say, "What is that?" Like you know you're you're outside a house and you heard that. What is that? And then they had to guess. And then you know she would set different things up. It was you know it got to the point where she wrote to there was a museum exhibit about uh, forensics at the Boston Museum of Science and the kids went there. The homeschoolers spent two hours there with my wife. The whole time they were there, three or four school groups went bombing through that exhibit. 
they went through and they like wrote to the exhibit people with specific questions about issues they had with different parts of the exhibit. And um, they received an incredibly nice reply from the uh, people down in Texas that created the exhibit. Really appreciative for some of the comments the kids provided. And they sent her a hair analysis kit, a real professional level hair analysis kit that everyone got into and, and that provided a couple of weeks of great entertainment. And that, that all grew organically out of the detective club. And of course you could figure out like all the, the math and science and blah 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 that you can add to that. Um, I've been known to do magic. I've been doing magic ever since I was six years old. I love sleight of hand and uh, stage and parlor magic. And so my youngest daughter, Audrey, got into it. And some of her friends asked her, oh, could you teach me? And she asked me to teach the friends. And next thing you know, we ran the stage and parlor magic club in our living room here. Sometimes we had as many as 20 kids show up uh, once a month for three hours because there was, was a lot of kids and I had a lot to do. And, you know, we just had a blast teaching tricks to each other. I would show videos and you know, demonstrate stuff. You know, we'd analyze the videos to try to figure out how things were done. Uh, talked about history of magic, got into all sorts of stuff, and then we performed for all folks' homes, for our homeschooling uh, get-togethers and stuff. Um, another thing that ha happened organically, my friend Sheila, her kids got into theater and they wanted to put a play on. So they put a play on at a block party and they called themselves the Puddle Jump Players. Other homeschoolers were there, and they said, we want to do a play, too. Next thing you know, the Puddle Jump players have gotten so big that they had to rent the theater. And we put on, I guess, maybe four or five plays at the Regent Theater and at the Massachusetts College of Art, all original plays that Sheila wrote and that involved, up, oh, my gosh, at least 50, 60 kids in some of the larger shows. It was amazing. I would play the saxophone or piano for, for some of them. They're, in fact, they're all musicals. Great fun. And again, all grew organically, sort of that way. My friend Maureen Carey has run a literature class in her home for homeschoolers for since I've known her. <laughs> and um, now her kid, both her children are grown up, as are mine, and she's continuing to do this. The literature class, I mean, what my girls remember the most of it is her challah bread. They loved the conversations and stuff, but Maureen always made homemade challah bread, and they would sit there and eat and talk about the books they were reading. Um, they would read the books out loud, and then you know Maureen would engage them in a directed conversation. Very popular. Uh, a really good class that one of my my oldest daughter Lauren took, because she was interested in um, science uh, biology at one point, um, was a biology course taught by a chiropractor. He invited the children, homeschooling dad, who was a chiropractor, and taught this class for three or four weeks, I think, in his office. Came in, the kids saw the anatomical models, he ran them through it. So it was a wonderful opportunity. Another friend of mine um, at the time was working for museums. He created exhibits. He was a, a professional uh, exhibit designer, but he had a love of photography. So he decided to share his love of photography with homeschoolers, and a bunch of kids did that. So, you know, you don't just have to look for um, opportunities. If you, want to, if, you're, if you need to socialize more, if you want to meet more people in your community, you want your children to have some friends, give a class. Or just give a talk or say, come to my house, let's have a discussion about sewing or something. You, know, you never know where these things are going to go. It can start off as a block party and then turn into a five-year program. The main thing is to just try stuff. If it doesn't work, fine. <laughs> Move on to the next thing. You know, It's not like school where your job is on the line and you might get fired. You know, So that's a good thing. I, I'd like to end... Um, and, and first of all, I'm going to end with this quote, but then I'll take any questions if we have time for that. Um, I want you to invite children to participate as much as they can in your life with you. But, and this is an important but, you must always make time for yourself and your, your, your spouse and your significant others and your friends. Um, a lot of homeschooling parents get too committed to homeschooling and, and forget that, you know, they also have to model for their child how to be a balanced, sane person. <laughs> They're not, not, you know, just like a teacher who like lives 24/7 at school. If you're living 24/7, planning your child's next day for for homeschooling, you're not having much of a life, you know. And so this letter from an early homeschooler from Washington State. This was in the original edition of Teach Your Own in 1981. It's from a letter that was in Growing Without Schooling in 1979. So, but the wisdom in this letter. Just, just stuns me every time I read it. So I'd like to share this with you and end this way. 
Um, this mother writes, I have never known how to stimulate children. I know that as a parent I should be raising my children in a stimulating environment so that they will not be dulled or bored. But what is more stimulating? A room full of toys and tools and gadgets, bright colors and shiny enameled figures? Or a sparsely furnished hand hewn cabin deep in the woods with a few toys carefully chosen or crafted, rich with meaning, time and care, and intimate with the elements of the earth? The only, the only world I can show them with any integrity is my world. Perhaps that is why field trips were such a disappointment for us. We started off in the fall doing something special, i.e. educational field trip once a week. After about a month we all forgot about taking these trips. They were fun, certainly interesting, but I think we were all sickened by the phoniness. Everyone knew the only reason we all trooped into the city to the aquarium was because mom thought it would be a good experience. Of much more continuing interest and probably greater educational significance in the truest sense are the weekly trips into town to do errands, to the bank, where we all have accounts and are free to deposit and withdraw as we please. The post office, grocery store, laundromat, recycling center, source of income for kids outside of parents, drugstore and the comic book racks, and the evenings at the library and the swimming pool. These things are real, things I would do even if no one joined me. That just happened to be important activities for all of us. When I am trying to stimulate their interest in something, the very artificiality of the endeavor, and rudeness really, I have no business really trying builds a barrier between us. But when I am sharing something I really love with them because I also really love them, all barriers are down and we are communicating intimately. When they also love what I love, a song, a poem, the salmon returning to the creek to spawn, the joy is exquisite. We share a truth. But our differences are also a truth. Common thread and fiber we share, but not the whole piece. And so I do my work each day, work which is full of meaning for me, and offer to teach it to them. Cooking, sewing, splitting wood, hauling water, keeping house, writing, reading, singing, sailing on the lake, digging in the garden. Sometimes they are interested, sometimes not. But if I were to try to stimulate them, sugarcoating various tasks, making games of various skills, preaching, teaching me to them. They would not have the time, great empty spaces of time, in which to search deep within themselves for what is most true about them. And neither then would I. Well, I want to end that here. If we have time for questions, I'd be happy to take some now. Pat, we've filled an hour. Well, I should say, you have filled an hour. <laughs> oh, okay. Once again. <laughs> there aren't any questions that have come through the application in the Hangout.